So we've got to use one of these three methods, um, and, uh, and and we'll talk a little bit about how each how how they look each one of them. Okay. So the first one is if we've got a publicly traded subsidiary, we can again this process is pretty straightforward for us. So we can look at uh, say Coca Cola here, and Coca Cola is a really interesting company um, because the parent company Coca Cola, um, the one that's head headquartered in the U S doesn't actually make much of their own product. Basically what they are is a holding company for the recipe. And they license the recipe out to a series of national and international bottlers that then use the recipe to make Coca-Cola in the different countries and then sell it. Right? And what the parent company does is license, both license the product and, old, and hold huge stakes in all the bottlers. Right? So they're a very unusual uh, company and, and very unusually organized. And what that means is they, they own, uh, they're a good example to look at this because they own a bunch of stakes and really like all of these bottling subsidiaries are, are pretty enormous uh, in terms of valuation and they own pretty big stakes in each of them. Uh, so you can see a list of them. Uh, this isn't an exhaustive list, but these are sort of the biggest ones. Uh, I think the first one that FIMSA, SAB, I think that's their African arm. Uh, Amatil is their Australian bottling company. Uh, HBC, I think, is their Chinese one. Uh, then I think that's like uh, the ice check, I think, is in uh, Iceland. Uh, then there's East Japan Bottling Company uh, in Bataladora. I think that's their South American arm. And then Coca-Cola Bottling Co., that's their American, their North American bottling arm, right? So they don't even bottle their own uh, products in, in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Uh, they uh, Actually, I think their Mexican one is separate, too. Uh, so that would just be U.S. and, and Canada. Um, and, and you can see that they've listed the book value of all those assets uh, and also what's called the fair value of all those assets, which is the market value of the stake. So the book value is what they paid for the stake. The fair value is the current market value of the stake. And all of these are publicly traded companies, which means we estimate the fair value of the stake by looking at the market value of the firm. Market value is just number of shares times price per share. So we can see a sort of breakdown here for the Amatil Limited, that's their Australian bottling company. Their market cap is like 9 billion. Coca-Cola parent owns like 30% of it, 29.2%. So the ownership stake uh, is, is about 2 billion uh, or a little bit higher than 2 billion. Uh, then we've got to convert that obviously from Australian dollars uh, to um, uh, to U.S. dollars, and there's the conversion rate, uh, and we convert the ownership stake, and in U.S. dollars, it's about 2.4 billion. So that is what we would then take and add to the value of the operations, right? So this would say non-consolidated non -consolidated subsidiary, Amatil Limited, value, $2.45 billion. Add that, and, and, and that's one of our non-consolidated subsidiaries. So that's really, really, honestly, that's super easy for us if we're an analyst to have a bunch of publicly traded subsidiaries. We can do this all pretty quick. We're just confirming the current market values and then confirming the relative stake in the firm. Uh, and, and they're gonna report that in the financial statement. So that's really the hardest part is to go look up the stake uh, and, 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 and understand that. If uh, we don't have public information about the firm, uh, then there's a couple things we can do. Uh, the important thing is that because uh, because these firms are private, they are not required by any kind of law uh, to unless they have some kind of outstanding public uh, investment available. They don't have to file any public financial information. Right? So by law, if you have publicly traded equity or debt, you have to file financial information with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Anyone can go on the SEC website go to Edgar, look up that financial information, we can have all of this uh, at no cost uh, for free for any public company, or actually any company with public debt, uh, E2. Um, private firms don't necessarily have any publicly outstanding debt or public equity, by definition they're private, uh, so they won't have any public financial information. Now sometimes big private companies might provide that, um, and certainly if we were inside of a firm that owned a stake in a private company, we might have access to that, uh, that financial information, depending on how big our stake was. Uh, and so if we have, a, a, say, like a 20 to 50% equity stake, we're probably going to have some level of financial information 
Um, and, and we're going to include some level of that financial information into our financial statements, right? So we are going to say partially consolidate that, uh, if that, uh, that company's financial information into ours. So that's a pretty big stake, 20 to 50%. We own a sizable minority, but not a controlling stake in the firm. So we're probably going to report things like net income and at least uh, some measure of book equity on the, on the parent company's uh, financial statements. Uh, and in that case, we can use what's called a simplified cash flow to equity valuation. This is another kind of valuation model like DCF. Um, well, I talked about it briefly in the very beginning of class. We talked about it. there's like five or six different common models. Uh, this is one of them where we can use a more limited amount of information uh, and the cost of equity uh, to, to estimate the company value. It's not going to be perfect, but if, if that's what you have, that's what you have. Uh, we can do multiples valuation if we, uh, if we don't have anything else. So this is just based on comparing the, uh, say, price to earnings or market to book ratio for this firm to another group of similar firms and saying that because these firms are similar, their financial ratio should also be similar and that can help us value the firm, right? That's the basis behind what's called multiples valuation. I say my price to earnings is 10 and that firm is similar, so their ratio should also be similar to 10. And that means that if we can look at their earnings, which we might know, and multiply that by their price, by the ratio to get their price, and that's how we estimate their value. Okay, so it's a very back of the envelope valuation measure. Um, it's common and, uh, and lots of people talk about it because it's so easy. It's, mul it's literally multiplying a ratio by a number. Um, it, it just doesn't give us the best information. It doesn't account for any of the things that we spent an entire semester being really careful to talk about. Um, but if that's all you got, again, that's all you got. You, you do the best you can. And, and that is going to be even better than this last one, which is like if I have a stake that's less than 20%, so I have a small minority stake, I may not have any information about the, the, the subsidiary, particularly if I'm outside of the firm. Uh, I may not have any information about the subsidiary beyond what the stake cost, its book value, and when it was acquired. Right? So I'll say, we spent $200 million to buy a share of PayPal in 2005. Uh, and that share at the time was worth 5% of the company. And that's it. Well, it's 2020. PayPal is one of the biggest companies in the world now. If that was the case, how would we value PayPal? Let's say, considering it was still a, a private company. Well, the last thing that we could do is we could, again, try to find a series of companies that are similar to PayPal. And, uh, you know, so if, say, Vimbo is public uh, and, and other companies like that, Square, close-ish, you know, and we could say, okay, those two companies are public. What did their share price do over the same time period? So from 2005 to 2020, their share price has tripled. So then the best guess we can say about our PayPal stake is that its value should have tripled also. And that's a tracking portfolio. Again, this is like the biggest of hand wavy hand wavers we can do. We're just like, yeah, well, it's close enough. And uh, that's gonna be, have to be where we fall. It's better than nothing. And we do need to value this stake uh, and, and at least estimate how the value of that stake has changed since we made it, um, and, and it's not going to be perfect. Now, when we talk about a, a different kind of subsidiary, here we're going to talk about customer financing arms. Uh, and, and again, this is uh, also a subsidiary of the firm, but it's a different kind of subsidiary. It's, a, it's one that is essentially a company-owned bank because the company recognizes that people don't have enough money to buy their product. And this can be a really valuable subsidiary for a company to have because they can now earn essentially what are interest on small loans. But uh, it's also uh, a difficult thing to value a bank. Notice that in none of the examples I've ever used have we ever talked about banks uh, because banks are a whole nother beast. They are extremely complicated financially and you can't use DCF style analysis to value banks. It just doesn't work. Uh, because banks are all turned around, right? Their assets are liabilities for other people, right? A bank's asset is the loan that it makes and, uh, and its liabilities are the money that people leave in its accounts. Uh, and so the money that they owe other people. Uh, so 
we don't value the financing arm with the operating arm because the method of valuation uh, and the assumptions that we make are completely different. What that means is we need to unconsolidate the financing subsidiary from the firm and value it completely separately. Uh, and uh, this is, if we don't do this, it's going to really distort our invested capital and our free cash flow. And ultimately, it's going to distort the, what we think about the company. Right? Um, and that's often because the, the financing arm will have better returns but more risk. Right? Again, risk and return trade off. So that shouldn't be surprising. But it'll make us uh, mis, uh, misestimate or misvaluate the company's operations, which aren't going to be performing as well. And the problem with this is it's complicated, and it's complicated to unconsolidate the financial statements. And I'll give you, a, we'll, we'll walk through a sort of small example here, but that's just sort of a little taste. And this is becoming more and more common, especially as things are getting more and more expensive. You know, we assume that the big car companies and, and things like that have financing arms, but also, you know, say Apple and Samsung now have financing arms because they're selling $1,200 phones. And most people are, are leasing their phone, essentially. They're getting on a two-year payment plan instead of buying it outright. And so now these big, you know, these otherwise, say, consumer tech companies have financing arms that if we're going to try to value these companies, we are going to have to unwind their financing arm from their operating uh, business.